Greetings, and bienvenue, mine crew. Thank you for returning to this broadcast. And welcome to new viewers joining us for the first time. If you like a video, then feel free to subscribe. Let's have a creepy Japan thread. Anything creepy, bizarre, anomalous, or anything scary in Japan? I'll start with Aum Shinrikyo. Over the next week, the full scale of Aum's activities was revealed for the first time. At the cult's headquarters in Kamikuishiki, on the foot of Mount Fuji, police found explosives, chemical weapons, and biological warfare agents, such as anthrax and Ebola cultures, and a Russian Meal Mi-17 military helicopter. The Ebola virus had been delivered from Zaire in 1994. Here were stockpiles of chemicals that could be used for producing enough sarin to kill four million people. Police also found laboratories to manufacture drugs such as LSD, methamphetamine, and a crude form of truth serum, a safe containing millions of dollars in cash and gold, and cells, many still containing prisoners. During the raids, Aum issued statements claiming that the chemicals were for fertilizers. Over the next six weeks, over 150 cult members were arrested for a variety of offenses. The media were stationed outside their Tokyo headquarters on Komazawa Dori in Aoyama for months after the attack and arrests waiting for action and to get images of the cult's other members. 1700s Mount Bandai, Japan. The incident began when villagers started reporting sightings of a strange creature lurking in wilderness along the fringes of town. This creature was said to look like a large primate of some sort, with a huge mouth, claws, and spiky fur running along its back. It was most often fleetingly glimpsed in the evening or twilight hours, and its eyes were said to glow or reflect light like a cat's. The beast was said to furtively stalk around the edges of town and seem to shun light. Villagers described how the thing would sit in pools of shadow just outside of the radius of a light source and glower from the darkness with its flickering, shining eyes. Despite its menacing appearance, at first the creature was easily frightened and would dart away into the underbrush from sudden light, shouting or loud noise, but it became increasingly bolder and more frequently spotted as the days went by. The strange monster was not only seen, but also heard. Loud, guttural, and clearly inhuman shrieks and howls were often heard at night emanating from somewhere on the dark mountain looming above. At times during the eerie night, the howling would last throughout the night, keeping the villagers awake in the grip of terror. The unnatural shrieks, howls, and sightings of such a sinister creature would have likely been enough to instill fear within such a small and remote rural community, but this was to be just the beginning of the village's nightmare. The creature became ever bolder and more aggressive as the days went by. Where at first it would retreat from noise or light, it started to display more menacing behavior such as growling at eyewitnesses. Villagers also reported being followed by the thing, which made less and less effort to conceal itself as it stalked them along darkened paths. The village placed guards with torches around the outskirts of town in an effort to drive away the creature, or at least discourage it from coming nearer, but it was not intimidated. The plan did nothing to dissuade it and perhaps even angered it. Several night watchmen described being rushed from the darkness by the creature and retreating from their positions in terror. At around this time, animals such as pets and livestock were reported to have disappeared without a trace. One farmer was said to have had every single one of his chickens disappear in a single night with only some scattered feathers left behind. The animal disappearances continued at an increasing rate and it did not take long for villagers to connect these vanishings with the odd visitor lurking in the woods. It was a realization that was confirmed when a farmer claimed to have spotted the mysterious creature killing a dog in a field. According to the man's account, the thing had already slain the animal and was in the process of disemboweling it when it was spotted and subsequently dragged its mutilated prey into the trees. People became wary of traveling outside during twilight hours and at night, yet even staying in their homes was no guarantee of peace. The creature was often reported circling homes and its deep, gruff breathing was frequently heard right outside of dwellings. Occasionally it would rap, scratch at, or even pound on doors, windows, and walls almost as if it were testing the structure for ways to enter as the terrified occupants cowered in their homes. It was also not uncommon for people to hear the thumping of its heavy footsteps across their roofs. One particularly harrowing account comes from a family of farmers on the very outskirts of town, 
who had their home actively attacked by the rampaging beast. In this case, the creature was said to have charged the doors full force while roaring in rage, and the doors rattled in their frames, threatening to cave in. The furious monster also was reported as hurling large stones at the dwelling. When it failed to gain entry, the beast slunk back off into the woods, leaving the house badly damaged and the petrified occupants no doubt scarred for life. This still would not be the extent of the bizarre occurrences unfolding around the village. As time went on, several children disappeared, with some reportedly taken directly from their own homes. The creature was even purportedly seen kidnapping children and dragging them screaming into the night as helpless villagers looked on in horror. Attacks on adults began to occur as well, and although the creature was not successful in killing any of them, some villagers were bitten, mauled, or at the very least left badly shaken. One village man described how the creature came so close to him during an attack that he could smell its breath, which was described as smelling of rotten eggs and fish. He was only able to escape after allegedly poking the thing in its eyes. It was at this time that the villagers took more decisive action and hired a well-known hunter to track and kill the beast that was terrorizing them. The hunter bravely trekked out into the surrounding wilderness in an effort to both kill the thing and draw it away from the village. During the hunt, the hunter described how the creature stalked him and circled his camp menacingly on several occasions. After a few days of tracking the creature, the hunter allegedly finally managed to shoot and kill it in 1782, after it tried to rush from the forest and attack him. It was reported to be so fierce that the bullet did not bring it down, and the hunter had to resort to repeatedly stabbing the thrashing beast with a knife to kill it. The hunter then dragged the body back to the village to display to the shocked villagers. The carcass was purportedly a somewhat ape-like creature that was one and a half meters tall, covered in hair and with a large mouth filled with fangs that was so oversized that it was described as being as if the head was split from ear to ear. Along its back were spines reminiscent of those of a porcupine. The creature also had a long, sharp nose and short limbs with webbed hands that ended in wicked claws. The carcass was reported to exude an extremely rank, overpowering odor, which unfortunately led to the body being discarded not long after. With the death of this baffling monster, the sightings, attacks, kidnappings, and animal disappearances all ceased. The Yonaguni Pyramids sank into the ocean at the end of the last ice age, around 10,000 years ago. In Okinawan folklore, there are tales of traditional gods and a land of the gods called Nirai Kanai, an unknown faraway land from where happiness is brought. The Yonaguni Monument may have been built to serve a similar deity. Japanese scientists have documented marks on the stones that indicate that they were hewn. Not only that, the tools used in this process have been found in the area and carvings have been discovered. Professor Kimura's unequivocal conclusion, based on the scientific evidence, is that the monument is man-made and that it was hewn out of the bedrock when it still stood above sea level, perhaps as much as 10,000 years ago. The principal arguments that he puts forward in favor of human intervention are on the record and include the following. Traces of marks that show that human beings worked the stone. There are holes made by wedge-like tools called kusabi in many locations around the outside of the loop road, a stone-paved pathway connecting principal areas of the main monument. There is a row of neatly stacked rocks as a stone wall, each rock about twice the size of a person in a straight line. There are traces carved along the roadway that humans conducted some form of repairs the structure is continuous from under the water to land, and evidence of the use of fire is present. Stone tools are among the artifacts found underwater and on land. Stone tablets with carving that appears to be letters or symbols, such as what we know as the plus mark and AV shape, were retrieved from underwater. From the waters nearby, stone tools have been retrieved. Two are for known purposes that we can recognize, the majority are not. At the bottom of the sea, a relief carving of an animal figure was discovered on a huge stone. On the higher surfaces of the structure, there are several areas which slope quite steeply down towards the south. Kimura points out that deep symmetrical trenches appear on the northern elevations of these areas, which could not have been formed by any known natural process. A series of steps rises at regular intervals up the south face of the monument from the pathway at its base, 27 meters underwater, towards its summit less than six meters below the waves. A similar stairway is found on the monument's northern face. Blocks that must necessarily have been removed in order to form the monument's impressive terraces 
are not found lying in the places where they would have fallen if only gravity and natural forces were operating. Instead, they seem to have been artificially cleared away to one side and in some cases are absent from the site entirely. The effects of this unnatural and selective cleanup operation are particularly evident on the rock-cut pathway. Kimura calls it the Loop Road, that winds around the western and southern faces of the base of the monument. It passes directly beneath the main terraces, yet is completely clear of the mass of rubble that would have had to be removed in order for the terraces to form at all. Experiences with spirits in Japan. Has anyone here actually been to Japan? When I was a kid, my brother and I would see spirits of all kinds in Japan. I of course had no clue what they were. The first one my brother and I saw was in our bedroom. I couldn't sleep and I was looking around, and I saw this green thing on the floor. It was a strip of a very bright green color with a mouth and eyes bright red. It had edges on the end and had very wavy arms. It did not move once or did anything. I get my brother and he sees it too. At this point we think this is a hoax, and it's just some projection from a machine at the ceiling, so we look up and see nothing. Still fairly convinced it's a light, we throw a pillow on it. When the pillow lands, the monster thing acts like a projection of light, so it just ends up being on top of the pillow. Being confused out of our eight-year-old minds, we call our parents, they walk in, turn on the light, and it's gone. They tell us to sleep and think we're both imagining things, turn off the lights, and it's there. My brother and I just try to go back to sleep. Another memorable moment was also in my bedroom. This is years after, and the spirits at this point are just annoying. Keep in mind that it's night, and the moonlight from my window will show the clock on my wall, but this time it was covered by a shadow. Being the ten year I am, to me, it looked like the grim reaper, scythe and all. I turn on the lights, and it's gone, turn it off, and it's back. At this point I keep flipping on and off the lights being amused. I go to bed with it hovering over me, convinced it won't do anything. Can anyone relate here with their experience in Japan? I know it's a long stretch, but it's been a decade since I'm in Utah now, and not a soul believes me. According to legend, Kuchisake Ona is a malevolent spirit, also known as an onryo, that haunts dark alleyways and streets of Japan at night in search of victims. She is described as a beautiful woman with alluring eyes, framed by long dark hair and a gentle voice that guides strangers towards her. However, beneath a surgical mask she wears around her face are horrific scars running from the corners of her mouth to her ears. If encountered by someone, she will ask them if they think she's beautiful. If the person answers no, she will instantly kill them with the long metal scissors she carries around. But if the person answers yes, she will remove her mask to reveal her mutilated face before repeating the question. Damn it. I remember reading some mangas about scary legends back in grade school, and Kuchisake Ona is definitely one of them. I'll drop some of the scariest that I can remember one. 3 AM Encounter A young girl, she was depicted as 10-ish, was visiting her relatives in a certain summer, where their village was celebrating a summer festival. All went well until she realized that it's late already, 12 AM, and she had to hurry home. Her relatives offered her to stay because safety reasons. What kind of grade schooler walks around at 12 a.m.? But she insisted on going. Her relatives yielded and gave her a paper lantern to help her navigate the way. On the way home, she noticed there's a stairway leading to a shrine, and somehow she can't resist the temptation of visiting it. She went up the stairs, and suddenly she realized that she's never seen that shrine before, and afraid that if she continued, she'd never return, and when she turned around to go back to the way she's supposed to go to get home, she saw a light slowly creeping up the stairs. I thought these stories I read are about old folklore, but I noticed there's some details that hinted modernity, so anything goes afraid that it's some local authorities that might arrest or question her. She hid behind a tree, but it's not what she had in mind. It's an old woman. Messy hair, wearing all white kimono, there are candles surrounding her head. Like she taped a series of candles or wore some kind of candle holder around her head while biting a knife. It's a priestess that curses people, using a straw doll as a means to deliver the curse by pinning the doll to the tree and driving a nail to the doll's chest with a hammer while cursing the target. The girl realized what she just saw and tried her best to muffle her crying while waiting for the accursed priestess to leave. 
She can hear the priestess slowly walking down the stairs, when suddenly she stopped. The girl's heart sank. Trying to get a glimpse of the priestess, she peered nothing. Looking from the right side of the tree she was hiding, she saw nothing. But when she looked from the left side of the tree, a wrinkled hand with dirty nails was grabbing the tree trunk. The girl gasped, while slowly looking up to see the angered face of the priestess, saying something that the girl would never forget. You saw me, didn't you? The girl screamed in terror, dropped the lantern, and ran as fast as she could towards the shrine on top of the stairs, while her chaser screamed, Wait! while shrieking and climbing the stairs faster than the average person. When she reached the shrine, she realized that it's too small to hide in, and she might be found soon, so instead she went to the toilet behind the shrine and hid inside the innermost stall. She was trying to not make any sound while listening to the sound outside when she heard footsteps slowly entering the toilet. The person outside opened the first stall. Finding it empty, she said, Nobody's here. Then onto the second stall, then the third, the fourth, until she reached the last stall, where the girl's hiding. The girl's heart pounded heavily, but she still tried her best to contain her fear. She strained her ears to hear the priestess's movement, nothing. She breathed a sigh of relief thinking her pursuer might have left her already, until she felt a chill on her spine, a breathing. Something was breathing above her. She looked up, and the priestess climbed the stall's door and glared over her head while grinning, and the scene was cut. I don't know if it's scary for you, but for me, that's one of the stores I couldn't forget, even after more than a decade. In May of 2008, I went to the island of Saipan. Saipan is near Guam and Japan. Before World War II, Saipan belonged to the Japanese. The Japanese had an airport there that had military buildings and bomb shelters. In World War II, the US military fought for the island of Saipan and took it away from the Japanese. The bomb shelters are well built and still standing today. The new airport is being built nearby. On a beautiful sunny day, I was exploring a bomb shelter. I was alone and happy and having a nice relaxing time. Birds and insects were making their usual noise and it was really peaceful. I went into the small door in the middle of the bomb shelter and stood just inside the door. I looked at the two rooms for people on the left and right side of the door. The two rooms were empty except for some crumbled concrete, litter, and some rusted metal sticking out from the walls. The light in the bomb shelter was pretty bright since it was so sunny outside. As I was standing there right inside the doorway, quietly looking around, the light suddenly started to get really dim inside the bomb shelter and I heard a rushing sound in my ears. The rushing sound was like if you put coffee cups over your ears, but much louder. Then a shadow rushed right by me and sat down on the bench seat that was now mounted on the formerly rusted metal sticking out from the wall. Several more shadows rushed by me and sat on the bench seats. One shadow would rush to the left room and the next would rush to the right room. The shadows were rushing by about every second and if they had both gone the same direction they would have collided. It looked like they had practiced drills of rushing into the bomb shelter quite a bit before. I could see the shadows. They looked like they were made out of gray cigarette smoke. I could see their heads and bodies but not their hands or feet. I saw that they were thin Japanese soldiers. They looked like they were about five feet tall and weighed about 100 pounds or less. Their uniforms were tidy and well-maintained, but the cloth looked like it was thin and getting worn out. I noticed that they all had their hats still on too. Nobody lost one during the rush. As each soldier rushed to the bench, he scooted over and made as much room for the next guy as he could. All the soldiers stared at the door and hoped more soldiers were coming. As each shadow rushed by, I realized there was not enough room in the doorway and they were actually going through me to get inside the bomb shelter. I could feel them pass through me. It felt the same as if I was holding my breath and releasing it as each shadow passed by. They were rushing by at about one shadow per second. I may have been actually holding my breath as each shadow passed by, and that's what I felt, and not the shadows at all, I will never really know about that detail. Then I could hear a loud rumble approaching in the distance and a few explosions. 
I could see the soldiers were still looking at the open door and waiting for the rest of their comrades. There were a few more empty spaces on the benches. I turned to look at the door, too, and I was surprised by the really bright light from the sunny day outside. The noise stopped at that moment. I turned back to look at the soldiers, and the bomb shelter was bright again and all the shadow soldiers were gone. I got nothing better to do, so might as well continue. 2. False Exit A boy was exploring his village where he grew up as a baby before moving to the city and found a really small cave, almost too tiny to be called a cave, but a grade schooler could definitely enter. The entrance is boarded, although loosely, and the boy just couldn't contain his excitement of finding a new adventure and decided to go in. He went inside, turned on his flashlight, and went deeper into the pew cave. Still couldn't determine where the cave would end, he pushed through until some spider webs caught his face and he flailed to break free and accidentally dropped the flashlight. He quickly grabbed it, tried to turn it on, smacked it a few times, to no avail. He's stuck inside a cave nobody might know about, surrounded by darkness, alone. He felt like the ceilings of the cave were watching him, so he turned his gaze everywhere to look for the exit, but he couldn't seem to find it. Suddenly, when walking around desperately to find the exit, he saw a light. Ah, that must be the exit, he said happily, when suddenly the light moved. Shocked, the boy fell to his ass as the light continued to spiral around in the darkness, followed by many other lights, until all those lights merged, and a figure appeared. Two figures, actually. A young girl, dressed in very old-fashioned clothes, carrying a younger boy on her back. The boy instantly recognized those attires from the history books. It's what people wear back in the Showa era, specifically the pre-1945 Showa era. The boy had just about thought it's the village people trying to rescue him, but seeing that it's some people wearing clothes that aren't sold anymore, surrounded by lights, looking bruised and dirty, the boy instantly realized they might not be living people. Sister, I'm hungry, said the little boy raucously. Don't worry, I will get us both home, replied the girl with a voice just as hoarse. The boy just couldn't contain his fear. He stood up, knees shaking, and just hurriedly ran away from where he was sitting. Just when he's about to lose hope, he finally found the true exit. He struggled to climb the blockade, fell to the ground just outside the small cave, and his visions slowly faded as he fell unconscious. Just before he completely passed out, he swore he could see two figures slowly walking towards the cave's entrance. The sun was beginning to set when the boy came to his senses, found himself laying on one of the rooms in his village home, surrounded by some villagers. The boy remembered what he experienced and told them all about it, and the villagers' expressions changed. One elderly woman then recounted a story. Back in the era of World War II, this village was not spared from the Allied forces' bombings. Although not as frequent as the cities, some stray bombers dropped one or two of their bombs here, or fired their guns, the horrors you might expect from the war. The boy knew where this was going. One day, when returning home from school, a young girl about your age and her younger brother had a very unlucky day. They were happily walking home side by side while holding hands with each other, when an aircraft fired its guns on them, thinking they might be Imperial soldiers. Most of them missed, but the very few that did hit them left severe wounds, too much to be handled by young children such as them. The boy can clearly see some of the villagers started crying, not like the boy couldn't understand. On their last breath, on their very last vestige of consciousness, they found a small cave. Afraid that the Allied soldiers might come and get them, the girl slowly dragged herself and her brother, barely breathing while covered in blood, to hide in the cave, hoping that someone might notice their trail of blood and rescue them. But miracles don't happen too easily. The village was in disarray, as the villagers were busy taking cover from the aircrafts, and when the villagers finally noticed the blood leading to the small cave, it was already too late. The girl and her brother have already passed away, covered in blood, while embracing each other. The villagers started gathering some fruits for offerings and went to the cave. And that cave was the cave where you went in. We boarded it up so nobody may tarnish that tragic site. It's like a local memorial site, if you will. But that's not the sole reason, is it? The boy said. The old woman smiled, a sad smile. You must be a really smart boy, she said. I will only say this. You were not the first one and might not be the last one no matter how hard we try. 
It was during the summer of 2012 a good time for walking or biking in Japan, because in winter you can't just get out of the house, especially when the snow is thick at around 5 meters in our place. I'm working for a construction company not so far from my apartment. If you will drive it, it's around 5 to 7 minutes, but because it was summer, I'm using my mountain bike that will take about 20 to 30 minutes from work until my place. I always take the road where most people use, less danger, and I can see the road clearly. Mostly when going home, I'm with my co-worker Kenji because his girlfriend was residing in the next building near to my apartment. One time when I'm with him, he suggested we take a shortcut and use the route that will cross the river of Kamenokawa. Not much light there because the light posts were not quite near to each other, but there's a part of it that will take around five minutes that only the moonlight is your guide for you to see your path. From 30 minutes biking, it reduces to 20 minutes because of that shortcut. One time Kenji got sick and took a leave for two weeks. It's because I'm not with him, that's why I use the normal road again. But suddenly my girlfriend from Tokyo messaged me that she will be staying in my apartment for a week, which means for a week I have to hurry home so I can see how she's doing. So I sacrifice for a week using the easy way. On the second day of using the shortcut, I saw a person dressed in all white with long hair around until her waist and she's facing the river. She's sitting on a bench with a light post near to the dark spot of the road. Because I'm in a hurry, I don't really give much attention to her. The next day I saw her again around 8 p.m. This time she's standing on the railings of the river. That's why I can't help but to think what is this girl doing here alone? I don't know her, and really Japan has a low crime rate, that's why I'm comfortable that she's safe and decided not to go near her. On the third day, I didn't see her anymore on the bench. Instead, I somehow see her in the middle of the dark spot of the road, standing on the railings and facing the river. Because it's dark there, that's why I decided to come to ask her what she's doing there and also to warn her. Around 10 meters away, I shout to her, Konbanwa, which means hello at nighttime. It seems she didn't hear me, so I came nearer. But around 2 meters away, I noticed she is not on the roadside of the railings. She's on the other side, that's why I can't help to look where she is standing. When I had a clear look, I saw she was not standing on anything she's floating on the river, and her hair was moving even though there was not much wind at that time. At that point, my whole body, including the hair from my wrist to the back of my neck, and my head all stood. I quickly turned back without knowing what is happening. My body is automatically responding to what I'm visualizing at that moment. I can't focus on pedaling my bike. That's why I decided to push it while running. While running, I took a glimpse of her and saw her, she was beginning to turn around on me. It was so dark and the next light post was around 40 meters away. I ran as far as I could without taking a glimpse thinking she's near my back. The light post got near but it seems to me it's still a hundred miles away. Safely I saw a car coming towards me. His light erased the darkness of the road and I didn't see the girl anymore. I told Kenji and we decided not to take that road ever again. Lately we figured that spot is where a girl around 17 years of age was hit and run by a car. Okay, that one was more sad than scary, but whatever. Think this will be the last one for now. Thread might be dead already, or my stories aren't worthy enough to bump. 3. The Man-Faced Dog This one is supposedly as famous and disturbing as the Kuchisake Onna, but somehow less popular and even might sound comedic. So if you watch enough he anime or read enough manga, or watch some videos about the daily lives of Japanese or even went there, you probably knew that many Japanese, especially Nihonjin sarariman, salarymen, office workers, drink frequently, typically in those local izakayas slash pubs slash street vendors, and they would iconically wear their ties around their heads while singing and puking all the way home stumbling. The man-faced dog is said to be encountered by the likes of them. The creature looks completely normal, like any other dog, and if you encounter it, it'll always be facing against you. Its ass is facing towards you. Being drunkards, legend has it that they would, either jokingly or seriously because alcohol, ask the dog for directions, only to find the dog turn around at them and show their man face, and speak, human language, and answer your question. Somehow those drunkards will come to their senses, realize that it's a dog with a human face, started talking, and they will piss their pants while running home. While I was in the Marine Corps stationed in Okinawa, Japan in 1995, I was at a shooting range near Camp Schwab guarding ammunition, sometime in August. I had just done a radio check at about 9.05 p.m. with range control to let them know everything was okay. 
I pulled my poncho up over my whole body because of the bugs attacking me. The next thing I know, my poncho is pulled off of me and I see what would be called a typical gray-looking alien, except that its skin was more of an almond color. It was a very bright night with a full moon, standing over me with what looked like four others behind him. What shocked me even more was that it talked to me, but it sounded like one of those adult characters on the Peanuts cartoons, like Wa Wa Wa. I remember just becoming unhinged, jumping up and starting screaming when it talked to me, and then it just disappeared along with the others. The other guy guarding ammo with me woke up when he heard me scream and asked what was wrong. I told him what had just happened, and he looked at me like I was crazy. I then noticed that it was 10.45 p.m., and I was like, what the heck? I know that I did not fall asleep because it was my turn on the radio watch. I know that I did not dream this, but cannot account for the missing time. I did not want to radio in what just happened for fear of getting a psych evaluation, even though an intruder near an ammunition dump is serious and should have been called in. The other Marine with me said that he was asleep the whole time and did not see or hear anything until I started screaming and jumping around. I kept quiet about this incident for a few days, but it was bothering me so much that finally, about a week later, I told a couple of my friends about it. A good friend of mine that had been out there a day before said that almost the same thing happened to him, except that he had chased it into the ammo tent, and when he was just about to shoot it, it just disappeared. He said that he was also afraid to say anything because he thought that people would think that he was crazy. I never saw any bright lights or alien spacecraft, just the aliens. Hitori Kakurenbo, a hide-and-seek game with a spirit you've called forward. A stuffed animal that has both arms and legs, rice, fingernail clippers, a knife, shard of glass or some sharp instrument, a needle with a long piece of red thread, a cup of salt water or Japanese sake, and you'll also need to draw a bath. First, you must give your stuffed animal a name. Let's say you have a teddy bear and you decide to call him Cuddles. Next, you cut Cuddles open and remove all his stuffing, replacing it with rice and a few of your fingernail clippings. After the stuffing rice transfusion, you need to sew him back up. Use the needle and red thread, making sure you have thread left over so that you can wrap it tightly around Cuddle's body. You know, making him look even more sinister than he already looks. At 3 a.m., you take Cuddles into the bathroom and draw a bath. You hold Cuddles in both hands and say out loud, For the first game, I'm say your name, going to be it. Say this three times and then drop cuddles into the water. Here you'll want to run around the house turning off all the lights. You're allowed to leave the TV on, but only if it's on a static filled station. Close your eyes and count to 10. Four, the melon heads. Title might sound like some rock band wannabe or amateur comedy tropes, but the story still haunts me today. 3JS, Joshi Shugakusei, female grade schoolers, call them Risa, Yuko, and Ayumi, went on a sleepover at Ayumi's childhood home, where Ayumi's auntie lives. The auntie welcomed them warmly, offered them treats and stuff, cooked them a delicious dinner, etc. While Risa and Yuko were busy admiring auntie's ancient home, Ayumi noticed that the persimmon tree owned by her neighbor next door has grown dry and nothing would grow on it anymore. Suddenly, she caught a glimpse of the uncle next door bringing an axe and tried to chop the tree, when suddenly she heard a shriek out of nowhere and gasped. She saw that the uncle clearly heard it, seem visibly distraught, and cancelled his plan and went inside. When night falls, the auntie said goodnight, before telling Risa and Yuko one thing, don't open either the curtain or windows at night. They agreed obediently while wondering what it's all about. Ayumi didn't know about it because she fell asleep already. At 10 p.m., Ayumi's still asleep, while Risa and Yuko gazed at the moonlight while chatting and leaving the curtain and windows open. They were busy chatting about the qualities of the boys in their school 
when they noticed the dried off persimmon tree. The thin branches only have little to no leaves and on one of the upper branches, two melons sit. Hey Yuko, are those melons I see there? Risa asked while yawning. Ha ha ha, no way you silly, there's no. Slowly the melons moved. What the, those aren't melons, Risa said clearly frightened. Uh, yeah, what is that? Yuko replied, finally saw what Risa meant. The melons slowly turned towards them to reveal the head of an old man and an old woman. They both screamed and ran towards Ayumi that's still asleep. Ayumi, wake up, wake up. But Ayumi still sleeps. They turned to look at the heads and they started floating and flying towards them. They ran downstairs while sobbing, fell to the floor and saw Auntie standing on the hallway. Auntie, the, the, there's a... So they appeared again. Auntie just proceeded to walk upstairs to Ayumi's room while holding a candle like a chad. There, she saw Ayumi fainted, and the two heads hovering above her while scowling at Auntie. Then, like a true Shinto priestess, she clasped her hands together, began praying, and the two heads felt guilty. Their expressions turned remorseful and flew outside. Shortly after, Ayumi came to, cried, Risa and Yuko hurried upstairs and hugged Ayumi. Auntie turned the lights on, closed the curtain and windows, and told them to sit on the floor. I've told you girls to not open them at night, didn't I? said Auntie, looking serious. We're sorry, Auntie, we didn't mean to, Risa and Yuko said while comforting Ayumi, still crying. Then Auntie just felt obligated to tell the story. A few years ago, Hoshikawa-san, the man who lives next door the place with the persimmon tree, had a serious argument that led to an uproar with his parents. They were screaming at each other for almost a week. Even some district's officials came to resolve the dispute, but nothing worked out. Until on the sixth day I woke up to hear commotion. I went out to Hoshikawa-san's place to see police lines and one of the officers led me to the backyard to question me about the incident that took place last night. The girls are shivering from fright. Hanging on the persimmon trees are Hoshikawa-san's parents. His wife found out about it first and called the authorities. They questioned me whether if I saw anything unusual last night, to which I replied no because I was already asleep. Long story short, the case was concluded. Nothing can be done about it. Their bodies were cremated. The Hoshikawas moved to the city only to return there on holidays, and every time they returned, they would hear those shrieks. And the persimmon trees stop sprouting persimmons. Instead, every night, there are those heads. The girl's tears have dried up to this point and asked one question. So what about you, auntie? Don't you want to move too? This house is my beloved house. Two flying heads aren't going to make me leave this house. This room is always an empty guest room and the curtain and windows are always closed. Every night I would check on those heads behind the close the curtain to see if they would do anything funny. Hearing that reply, the girls fell silent and apologized for their mistake and Auntie forgave them while smiling. The next morning, the girls looked at the tree before they went home to see Hoshikawa-san crying on the ground while saying, I'm sorry, please forgive me. His wife was behind him holding an ax. Last month I visited Japan again for an opening ceremony of a new hospital at Hokkaido. It was Chinese New Year and there were many visitors around. And there is a saying going, the more visitors, the more accidents. That night, right after the party, two patrons were sent to our hospital because of a car accident. It was due to a slippery road. The car lost control and spun 40 meters across the bus road and smashed into a tour bus. Luckily, there were no tourists inside or around the bus at the time, but the bus driver had his lower body crushed where the car had smashed. The driver of the car was an old man heading to a wedding ceremony. Information from the police said that he stepped on the brake too suddenly that the rear tire slipped. Very unfortunately, the car driver died immediately. That night, the family of the car driver came over and we had to tell them the tragic news. Meanwhile, the bus driver was rushed to do an immediate operation. We needed to observe him and decide whether or not to do another operation some days later when he woke up. We found that the bus driver's family had not come over and we realized that he was living alone and had no family. The bus driver did not wake for almost a week. His company's co-workers and managers did visit, but none of them stayed for too long since he was not in a good shape. The doctor decided to do another operation since the time is limited and they could not wait for him to decide. We had to think the best for any patrons. The operation did not go perfectly. 
From the doctor's information, the patron was bleeding badly during the operation and the health condition of him was not too good. The patron died that evening, making it the second death in our hospital. That night, when I went to tidy up the patron's room for the next day's use, I saw a person facing the wall, mumbling to the wall. I tried to go and ask him who he was, but I was stopped by a nurse who had worked at the old hospital for years. She pulled me over and told me to never speak to such people. I suddenly realized that the person I saw looked just like the injured bus driver. I may have experienced the hospital's first ghost story. I hope that you enjoyed tonight's broadcast. If you enjoyed tonight's story, then please subscribe to the channel as more green texts will appear daily. A new broadcast will appear when the clock strikes. Midnight Central Time. Remember to check the Odyssey and Rumble pages for separate archives of previous broadcasts.